just to begin, uh, for people, your book is about post-colonial literature um, and, and more broadly, you have a critique of post-colonial theory. So I think I wanna start just by asking, for people who are unfamiliar with post-colonial theory, um, can you briefly explain kind of when and how this discipline arose in academia and what its main contributions have been? Uh, sure, and um, I was listening to you guys all this time, and I think uh, you're doing an excellent job of, uh, you know, where the theory has gone to. Um, so in terms of emergence, I think, uh, you know, even though it emerges um, in a definitive way in the 80s, um, the, the genealogy of post-colonial theory, I, I would say, goes back to the 60s. And um, when we think of the 60s, you know, we're talking about broad social movements along um, uh, race, gender, anti-war, the Cuban revolution, the anti-war movements. So it's a very progressive milieu. Um, and at the same time, um, along with these, you know, these sort of uh, broad social movements, what we had was um, a vast expansion of the US universities. Um, it was, you know, for the first time, it was not just an elite enclave, but for people, it, it massively uh, increased in size and it became a credible social ladder. So between the social movements and, uh, and the expansion of the universities, there was a very strong push for a democratization of curriculum and the way, um, you know, uh, curriculum was taught. Um, so this, you know, th th this was very important. But on the other hand, there was also a contradictory pull, um, which is that this is also a time when there was an acceptance of the loss of the of a broad socialist vision, um, because it was the time also of um, deregulation of, of free trade, of decimation of unions. So there is a contradictory pull. And um, if you think about it, the new left, uh, it sort of enca uh, encapsulates this pull in both directions. So it's on the one hand, very radical. On the other hand, it is a ki the kind of radicalism that's not very threatening. Mm -hmm. And post-colonialism, um, when it emerges in the 80s, is you know it emerges from the broad umbrella of the of the of the new left, and it similarly sort of captures this this contradiction. Um, I want to say that it was you know it, it was very much influenced by certain sort of broader things that's going on that was going on, which is the decolonization of Africa, a very strong ethos of third worldism, um, the affiliation, a strong affiliation of the communist movement with the South. Um, so all of this helps to, uh, you know, to talk about anti-colonialism in a, in a very strong way. And post-colonial theory draws on all of that, but then it makes the, a very vital move of not, not uh, you know, it does not introduce studying colonialism in addition to what Marxism had brought to the table, but instead of. So it tries to displace a mm. class with the study of colonialism. So um, so that's, you know, th th that is the, in, in some ways the main sort of assumption of post-colonial theory that, um, that it, it, it wants to displace class analysis with anti-colonialism. It is not this and that but uh, and again they will never quite clearly come out and say that but that is what is underlying um you know the underlying assumption of post-colonial theory yeah, I was going to say, I think that uh, several, uh, if, if not many, of the leading post-colonial theorists actually do themselves identify as Marxists, right? Absolutely. Um, but yeah. But I so I guess I then want to follow up by um, you. You are starting to touch on this a little bit, but what are some of the real limitations of postcolonial theory as an academic discipline, and then by extension um, as a political framework for the left? Because I think something you look at uh, in your work is kind of the relationship between the trends that are coming out of the academy, right, and and the left, mm -hmm. as as we had mentioned before. So um, you know, first of all. I, I do want to say uh, before going into the limitations, and I, you know, assume that we will be doing um, that quite a bit here. But I do want to say that 
post-colonial theory with all its problems did make a very salient contribution. Mm -hmm. It completely changed the nature of literature departments and, uh, you know, which were completely a haven of the, you know, the Western canon. It, it transformed that and it was a very hard fought battle. And I think that is something that does need to be recognized. Uh, but not only brought in non-Western literature, but also changed in the way this literature uh, has been taught and will be and is, it, you know, continues to be taught. So in, in that sense, it is a huge contribution. Um, so in terms of limitations, see, the limitations are both, there are limitations, uh, theoretical, academic limitations, and then, of course, political limitations. Um, in my book, I talk uh, within my discipline what the, you know, what the limitations are in terms of literary analysis. And let's keep in mind that post-colonial theory as broad as it is today in terms of its influence, um, it was born within literature departments. So to me, that was, you know, that's very interesting that mm -hmm. it, they, what what we see is that there is a remarkable failure by post-colonial theory in reading post-colonial literature. That's mm -hmm. the argument that I'm making, that the theory fails um, in reading post-colonial literature itself. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I mean, I don't want to go into, you know, too much details, but um, the, the primary thing, I think, what it misses out on because, uh, as you know, as you all were discussing earlier, because it, the, the analysis, it's such a, a fundamentally a culturalist analysis based on difference. What it misses out on is post-colonial literature, much like any literature, is extremely, of course, extremely anchored in culture, in context. How could mm -hmm. it be otherwise? But it also transcends that and, and, you know, is able to speak to other cultures and other times. And that's why it becomes relatable. And that aspect is completely missed out by post-colonial theorists. And, you know, that is that's that's a real problem. And, um, you know, I could go more into detail in terms of certain authors, but keeping that aside um, for now, um, do we want to talk about the political limitations or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, again, <laughs> you were doing such a good job, so I don't know, you know, where to begin. But I, I, I think in in some fundamental way, what um, where the theory becomes problematic is that it it sees um, politics primarily based in culture rather than in interests, mm -hmm. and. Culture is then what leads to its sort of particularism, right? As opposed to interests, which would be universal because human beings have the same interests. They do not like to be oppressed. They they fight against, uh, you know, against against uh, their freedom being taken away, or again, be they economic freedom or political freedom. We see it time and again, and you know, those are our material interests. The need, the, the fight against material deprivation. These are universal sort of um, issues, which are so basic and fundamental. On the other hand, but with this, with a stroke of a hand, when you bring in culturalism, all that becomes obscure. So that I think is is you know is um, a real issue um, with postcolonial theory. But what is interesting is because the theory is primarily concerned with the global South, it keeps its radical veneer, mm -hmm. right? Um, the the radical pretense of of addressing something which it claims where all other theories have failed, um, both in terms of the global south and in general in terms of representing what it calls the subaltern or the oppressed. Now, which is, of course, absolutely untrue. I mean, Marxism has al always spoken for the global south in terms of, you know, colonialism, empire, imperialism. All these issues have been very, very central in the works of key Marxist theorists, from Marx himself to mm -hmm. Lenin to to uh, to Rosa Luxemburg to Bever to so many Marxist theories, the dependency theories. Um, you know, one can have issues with them, but they were all trying to understand the global South. So to say that Marxism missed the boat is just not true. Um, and in terms of impact. It has had huge impact all over the South, right? I mean, I grew up in India. Marxism was huge. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, but in, you know, much more so in some other countries in the in, in South Africa in the movement in South Africa, you know, earlier than that in Algeria, all over Latin America, China, of course. So all over the world, I mean, outside the West, it's been the single most important uh, uh, theory, which Marxism, which has had the, uh, to, to have had that kind of impact. So it's a very problematic um, uh, to to put it mildly, premise on which postcolonial theory erects its you know entire edifice. Mm -hmm. So I actually want to uh, jump back now to talk a little bit about the literary qualities of some of the postcolonial theorists, um, because a lot of the postcolonial theorists, and I think you know Homi Baba and Gayatri Spivak in particular, have come mm -hmm. under fire or or constantly come under fire, right, for writing in a very kind of dense, jargon-heavy, uh, some people say obscurantist manner. Um, and I actually want to read just a few lines from Gayatri Spivak's famous text, "Can the Subaltern Speak?" Uh, just you know, in case people want a taste of it. So she writes, in subaltern studies, because of the violence of imperialist, epistemic, social, and disciplinary inscription, a project understood in essentialist terms must traffic in a radical textual practice of differences. The object of the group's investigation, in the case not even of the people as such, but of the floating buffer zone of the regional elite subaltern, is a deviation from an ideal, the people or subaltern which is itself defined as a difference from the elite. Um, so this is pretty dense. Um, and, you know, I, as you mentioned, Spivak has a background in literary theory and deconstruction. She's clearly not the only person in these, you know, fields writing this way. Um, and, and actually, I want to say for the record, you know, I studied English in, uh, in college. And when I came across Can the Subaltern Speak for the first time, I actually kind of enjoyed like sort of looking at her like crazy language and trying to like pull it apart and and figure out what it meant so i don't i'm not saying we should you know dismiss the text like out of hand just for being dense and jargon heavy but you are also in the english department and you don't write this way your book doesn't read like this so i'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you see the purpose or function of this type of language being um why do the post-colonial theorists write like this <laughs> Great question, Jen. <laughs> I Way out of my depth. I'm wondering about this. I mean, indeed. I mean, you know, as as we all know, when when you have something to say, right? When you when you have a good thought, an idea, a theory, you want people to understand it. You want to communicate. You want people to be on the same page. You want to persuade people. So why write in a way which actually puts people off? I, it's, it's a real puzzle. Um, you know, some of the things that I'll say there, I don't think it's rocket science, is part of it is that, you know, it, uh, it's heavily influenced by continental philosophy, which tends to be jargonistic. So some of it is just that jargon. But I think there is, and, you know, I'll go out on a limb. I think there is a deeper reason here. Um, much of post-colonial theory when you you know when you get into it there isn't that much going on there there isn't that much that is being said i mean you know i like you have struggled with spivak and i would read a paragraph and reread it and i'm like okay so all you are saying is something like i don't know marginalized women do not get much of a hearing like why not say that and then I realized that that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. If she says just that, then where is the novelty? I think it's a search for novelty. They mm -hmm. hide behind language to pretend like they're, that they're saying something which has not been said. And I think it, you know, it does immense harm. I mean, I've seen in graduate departments where people think that something is wrong with them, that they're mm -hmm. not understanding it. Of course it is smart. Of course, if they, you know, there's nothing wrong with Baba. It has to be me. I mean, no, if you're a reasonably intelligent person and you want to learn and you cannot understand, you are so not the problem. So, yeah, yeah don't get yeah. me <laughs> I feel I feel so seen right now. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, in your book, you focus a lot mostly on, on post-colonial literature, but you kind of more in general challenge the binary between the universal and the particular through what you call radical universalism. So can you explain... Um, what is radical universalism and how do you think this can help the left think through politics today? Right. Okay. Um, so, you know, speaking of the book, um, the, the 
phrase radical universalism, if I may, um, you know, where it comes from, actually um, the, the idea came to me many years back when I was reading Frederick Jameson's what is an iconic essay on third world literature, where he says uh, all third world literature should be read as national allegory. Uh, and it became very infamous. There's like a huge debate on it. It's been going on and, you know, I address it in my book. But at the heart of it, what, you know, Jameson, who's a Marxist critic, what he is saying is um, it is vitally important for first world scholars to um, to not read third world literature as an extension of the kind of literature that, 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 that the West has always known, but to understand where it is different. Again, the, the theme of difference. So, you know, it's, he, he comes from not a bad place, I will say that. Um, but then he says, well, what are my options here? I understand that if I read it as difference, and Jameson is a very smart guy, so he sees that once you start reading it as difference, it brings in the whole baggage of, you know, reading a whole part of the world as Orientalist. And he says as much that it runs that risk. But again, he says it's worth the risk because if we do not do that, then we are left with, and I do not remember the exact quote, but something like a general and lib uh, a generalized liberal humanism. Um, and when I read that, you know, it stopped me in my tracks. I'm like, why would a Marxist think that those are the only options, right? That either we do not appreciate the, the, the rootedness of, of, um, of other cultures, or we have to brush them, you know, uh, in the, in the, uh, as in the same way, in the same colors as, as the way we have always understood Western literature. Why can't we do, uh, why can't we understand literature as it is that, of course, it is anchored in culture, of course, it is rooted in culture, but it is doing much more than that. And especially as a Marxist, how, how do you not get that, right? So that's where, you know, the, the, the phrase of radical universalism, because, okay, what I forgot to say is, um, Jameson says we need to appreciate the radical difference of the of the third world. So it is an opposition to that that you know that I thought radical universalism is what something that we can work with. Um, and what is radical about the universalism? It's true with something that postcolonial theorists have pointed out that universalism has been employed, um, you know, in in ways in very oppressive ways in um, especially in the context of colonialism. But there are other ways in which universalism can and will always be used for the purposes of emancipation and liberation. And that's where that's why I call it um, a radical universalism. Um, I forget, Paul, what was the second part of your question? So how do you think this concept can really help the left today in uh, thinking through politics? Right. I mean, I think what it can do is, you know, what what you were, were talking about earlier, that this kind of pervasive sort of culturalism, which is the other side of the coin, really, of racism, um, that it, it gives us the tool to, to fight that. Um, because once we understand that, you know, people's, um, that, that politics should be rooted in, in people's interests rather than culture, which is not to say that culture does not matter. Of course it matters. Of course you take it into account. But it's a question of what you grant primacy to. So, um, um, you know, if we might talk about the Bernie campaign, I think that's, you know, that's where a lot of it came into play, um, where um, the, we heard th this idea of socialism as a, as a white concept, right? And the the problem, of course, with all of that is is manifold. First of all, it's just false that socialism um, being a Western concept, you know, I just talked about how it has had this huge influence all over the global South. And Paul, as you were saying, all these, you know, non-Western theorists, you know, Fanon, Ciela, James, uh, Cabral, Guevara, M. and Roy, my favorite, you know, somebody who founded two communist parties. So 
the idea that um, th that that socialism is a Western concept is just um, factually wrong, right? Um, then we come to the whole idea of politics, and um, I think you know again you were grappling with it, and you've been grappling with it. In, you know, I know for a while, um, but. In the Bernie campaigns, some of these things became kind of concrete where the idea was floated that universal programs do not help racial or you know other minorities, right? Programs like Medicare for all or uh, free college or minimum wage, whatever uh, what you have, because the argument being that even if you get those things, minorities will not fully benefit from that. Right, that broadly, that that, that was the uh, that's the charge, and I think as as socialists we have to say it's true. First of all, we need to acknowledge that it's true that if you have universal programs, it will not do away with racism tomorrow. That is absolutely true. So if you have something like um, universal care, as you have in Europe, will there be uh, uh, you know will it be differentially implemented? There will be some of that. No question about it. And we have to fight that. But will it be a darn sight better than what we have now? That is the question, right? Same then goes for, say, uh, you know, um, free college. That free college, you know, so what if, for instance, you know, blacks have um, uh, degrees, graduate degrees, because there is an earning gap, even, even amongst, you know, people who are, um, who have bachelor's degree? That's a that's an argument that's often, um, you know, that, that's put forth. Um, but if you look a little deeper into it, and I've spoken earlier about this, yes, there is a gap, but the gap goes uh, becomes narrower as, as as you climb the ladder of academic degrees. So there is a bigger gap with high school degree. The gap is much smaller when you have a bachelor's degree, and almost vanishes when you have a graduate degree. And the reason there are fewer, you know, graduate min minority graduates as opposed to whites is because it's just expensive. So of course, you know, a free college will help. And sim you know, with minimum age again, the similar argument. So I feel that um, that's where the idea of universalism in concretely, I think we have to hammer this home that it is it is not just a theoretical argument, but it is not the best way, but the only way in which we can address, you know, people's issues of material deprivation. And you, you touched on this already a little bit when you uh, were talking about the expansion of the university, but, you know, it used to be common to find Marxists who advocated for universalism in academia, and those views were not really mm -hmm, controversial mm -hmm. on the left. So right. what kind of explains this shift to where right. Postmodernism, postcolonialism has been so hegemonic, and these ideas now that you know were common sense of the left are so rejected. How how did we get to this point where these are the ideas that are hegemonic now? Um, Why and how postcolonialism became a hegemonic discourse? Yeah. I mean, part of it is like as I said, you know, because of because of the history. Uh, but you know, there are a few other things. I mean. Um, I think it is, and I think Jen, maybe, uh, you know, you said it at some point, I, I remember you saying it, or maybe it was an email, <laughs> um, that it is also a theory that emerges as as a point, at a point of defeat. I mean, you know, four decades of unremitting attack on, on, on the working class, on unions, and therefore not just the working class, but on our working class power, um, has led to a milieu where it becomes, you know, very, very difficult to think of an of an alternative way of doing things but so if you want to be radical but you have given in to the defeat then it comes in as a very you know useful theory um keep in mind also that you know postcolonial theory unlike marxism has emerged from from academic departments it emerges from universities from tenured professors so there is a very strong class component here right um 
in terms of you know who stands to benefit from it so it is it's unthreatening to the to the power structure but it gives them their radical credential and i think that's why you know that's why it it has become hegemonic in terms of where it is coming from and who it is serving if that makes sense oh you're uh, on mute jen, jen. No, yeah. I'm always doing that. Um, I, I was just saying, I, I want to kind of zoom out now and just ask you about um, uh, maybe Marxism more broadly, because I think, you know, socialist Marxist or socialist politics, um, you know, on a kind of very broad level, want to sort of explain the laws of motion, right? Like the massive transformations uh, that we see in capitalism that occur across economies and nations. So like very macro level kind of phenomena. But at the same time, we also, when it comes to doing politics, have to operate in very specific and particular situations such as running a campaign for office or, you know, organizing a workplace even. So so how do Marxists or how should show, socialists balance these two things uh, like yeah. theory and practice? Yeah. Yeah. I guess I guess that was a compl complicated way of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. That was no, no. I think that's that's it's a very really good question to which, you know, uh, there is I mean, there is no deep answer to that. I think you do both by doing both. But I, I mean, I would just step back and just say that. Um, you know, Marxist theory is, uh, a, a lot of the theory is pitched at a very high level of abstraction for sure, as most theory is. Mm -hmm. But it also, sh you know, it, it's derived from what is happening at a very local level. It's not academic in that sense, right? It is derived from what is happening at the shop floor. And, and that, kind of give and take is what gives, uh, you know, theory its lifeblood. But it's also something that, you know, activism need and should be informed by. So so there, it's, it's a two way street. And I mean, you know, there's a lot to say about this uh, for, you know, somebody like me who's in a academic union. I mean, I, I do think that you can be a great theorist, but that does not necessarily make you uh, you know, somebody with leave alone being a good organizer, but somebody who has good political instincts. It it just does not translate necessarily. Now you could be both, sure. Um, but so so that's something to be remembered. But that does not mean that you cannot that you that that you have to be an organizer to be a good theorist. I don't buy that either. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm sure that there are people and there I mean I would say the majority who are able to theorize very well without being in the trenches. Um, however, <laughs> I think the converse is not quite true. I think most good organizers are good theorists. You know, they may not be writing theory, they may not be doing theory, but you know, at the back of their mind, they're always generalizing, which is what theory is, you know. So you go, you speak to 10 people on the on the shop floor and you learn something something much more general and then you use it moving forward right and that's what makes somebody a good theorist and um i mean in terms of you know how you do both i again i think you know marxist socialists have been doing both for a for a long time now um think of you know think of unions think of people um campaigning in the day and doing night classes, understanding theory at night, but also in terms of broader praxis, you know, in terms of unions um, negotiating contracts that are relevant for their workers, but through that understanding, uh, you know, what a class-wide campaign would mean. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's, you know, that that's that's doing both. That's mm -hmm. doing what is what is local, but what what's also um, something much broader and something like that of course gets very complicated when we think of medicare for all where it is not happening very much right in terms because unions are in some ways very much locked into you know the 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 kind of benefits that they have been able to extract of management in terms of healthcare so there is a kind of blindness in terms of how this needs to be pried open and become a class wide movement which is both theoretically sane, but also makes complete sense in terms of material interests. 
Um, so yeah, so again, you know, you do both by doing both. <laughs> right, right. I don't think I have any more questions at the moment. Do you, you Jen? Um, I, I think that's actually a great note to end on. Um, but I want to shout out, Nevedita, your book again, uh, World in a Grain of Sand, out now from Verso, Postcolonial Literature and Radical Universalism. Nevedita, thank you so much. Uh, that was a very enlightening conversation. We're happy to have you on. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you.